Oh, there it is. Now do a screen share. I just click the green, just the big green box. And select the, uh, uh, yeah, screen two. And we should be good. Okay. Yay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Ashley. You. See ya. Might be the wrong screen. How's everybody today? This is Christian Jones over here. You guys have been stuck with me once already. How oh, did that work? Come on, baby. Oh, I think we are completely out of luck, Christian. All right. Yep, we're going to have to manually do it. It's going to be really slow. Okay, we're on. Let's do it. All right, guys. My name is Wes. This is Mr. Christian Jones. Christian, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. So, like you said, my name is Christian. I work on the Varus Network uh, with Wes. Um, yeah, I've been there a little over a year, uh, primarily in the ISA department. So, a lot of what I'm doing is what we're about to talk about. Um, speaking with for sale by owners and expires every day, it is a large part of what our business um, is kind of built around. Um, we found a lot of success to it, and there's definitely business there. Uh, we know there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, pre-call bias that goes into these calls, um, thinking, you know, they're going to say one thing when you have no idea because you haven't picked up the phone yet. So uh, here to just kind of give some insight on what it kind of looks like and, and make it a little bit more comfortable for everyone. Yeah, that was the most modest introduction ever. Christian's an absolute badass when it comes to outbound calling. Like, you guys, I, I, we, we kind of joke, but your set appointment to close ratio is, like, ridiculous. It's like, what was it, like, 86%? It's 86%. If he sets an appointment with a FISBO or expired, it's somewhere around 86% of the time it closes. Not appointment held. Like, appointment held, they sign... You listed or help them as a buyer and it closes. Like, it's silly, like really silly. So who better to teach this than Christian? Christian's also been teaching at Missouri State about how to get involved in real estate. So his um, his heart revolves around this kind of stuff. And this is one of his growth tracks, a lot like mine, through KWU, like we talked about last time. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and kick us off introduction. Christian, I will be bounced back and forth a little bit on content. As always, stop us if you guys have questions or anything. Can someone online put something in the chat so I know you can hear me? Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Oh, there it is. I hear you, Brian Jackson. You're the man. All right. Oh, I got a box from David Caldwell and all good. Sweet. All right. So you guys know my basic ground rules. Number one, everything stops for a contract. So if you are currently negotiating anything, you, the whole world stops for you. If you need to take care of that contract, is that okay? Cool. Beautiful. Uh, number two, drama versus productivity. We went through this last time when drama is high, productivity is low. When productivity is high, drama is low. So in this class, one of the things that we have to agree on is any question is a fair question. There's no dumb questions. And if someone does ask a dumb question, it stays in the class. Is that fair? Okay. Other than it's being recorded. Other than it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it gets sent to anyone, though. Is it being recorded? I don't know if it's being recorded. I don't know if she Yeah, it's, it's in the top corner of the uh -oh. screen. Look at that recording. This is uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Um, guys in the chat, Christian and I are going to go back and forth monitoring. So please feel free. This will be better than the last time I taught. We'll actually look at the chat and help answer questions there. So the last thing on drama versus productivity, one of the things that's so cool about the lead generation series is it's all about productivity. It's all about lead gen, right? Oh, yeah. Look at that. I brought it all the way up here. Thank you. Who else needs one? I know there are some online. I can't find one. Okay. Thank you. Well, you guys got it? I got it online. Sweet. That was all messed up anyway. All right. So one of the cool things about this class is it's entirely productivity. So if you want to eliminate the drama from your real estate career, get off the real estate roller coaster and not have to complain about the bad leads or the whatever, then this course is the best for it. All right. We're going to work forward here. Ground rules. 
Um, you just gave me my ground rules. Look at that, arrival time, whatever. Okay, exercise, where you are today. Let's go to that page, it's page five. Um, here we go, the last 24 hours, I believe. Um, let's write down what lead generation activities we've done maybe in the last 24 hours. But this time I want you to write down the ones that you've done that you haven't done before or a new lead generation tactic or something you did as a result of these courses. All right, so we're gonna take a moment, write it down there on page four, and then go ahead and answer questions two, three, and four. This is the awkward part where we all wait. And then I get guilty because I'm not doing it. <laughs> not giving you 10 minutes for this either so aren't these designed for three hours of four hours these are designed for four and we're doing it in two yeah that's why it's like pure chaos it's like in this in this in this in this in this yeah love it exactly right yeah. i got i taught it yesterday in joplin i taught working with vets in joplin yesterday we had a, almost 30 people there 40 people and one of the complaints was like you move through the content too fast it was like yeah, there was 72 pages of content and we had two hours. Like, you have to give me a little bit of grace there, you know? All right, guys, lead generation activities. What did you guys put in that first box? Anything? We did an open house and then I posted on social media a short walkthrough. Nice, yeah. that's awesome. How did it go for me for you? What were your ahas or wins out of that? I did have a lead and she actually will be listing her home and with a buy. Yeah. So it was really nice and kind of getting to meet her and kind of educate her about the market right now. I, I just came from the team meeting, so that was nice. Had a lot of content. That's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. It's so funny how we do these little activities and they generate huge results, right? Like open houses are incredible. Like I can spend two hours on the weekend in a house. And it might bring me like $7,800 down the road. Like, that's insane. I love them. What else? Anyone else have any other lead gen activities they did? Cool, cool. Yeah? What were your thoughts? Wins? What did you do? I got two leads out of it. Dang. <laughs> One good. buyer and a possible seller. Awesome. And it works, doesn't yeah, it? It does, absolutely. That's so cool. The reason why people do it, it works. Right. And it's so funny, especially on this topic too, when we were talking about it, he's going to go into, you know, what are BISBOs, what are expireds, but we were talking about it. I didn't build the old Litton Keats team at all on expired or FISBOs, like at all. But then Dan Holt's team, who we merged with recently to form Veris, he built his entire business on expireds and FISBOs. It was kind of funny when I was looking at it, I was like, Wow, that's really unique how we blended these two sides of the spectrum and neither one was right or wrong. Right? They were just different. So, all right. So here's where we are in the course. I know course number five was your favorite and it always will be. But we've talked about the power of one. We've talked about your validity and positioning in the market. Whether you're a new agent or an experienced agent, agent you have a story to tell. And that's huge, right? Use your story to position yourself. So for instance, I always joke, like when I was a new agent, my number one like response to people who were like, oh, we're going to list with Adam Grady or Dan Holt. My response was always, well, don't worry. You're never going to talk to them. You'll actually talk to me, right? This is my personal cell phone. And it would just like, they would never think of it. Like, oh, you might list with them, but most likely, most likely never going to actually talk to them. You're going to work with someone on their team. Now it's the opposite, right? Now it's like, oh, you get to work with someone on our team. We've trained them. and we'll play. <laughs> So you just work on your positioning in your conversations, right? We've talked about prospecting. Can someone give me a prospecting definition? Asking people around. Okay. Yeah. For business or if they know anybody who's wanting to sell. Yeah, that's good. How else might we define prospecting? What additional things make that prospecting? It's proactive, proactively searching for new business. Yeah, so you use the word asking, so proactive, we're proactively asking, right? So we're the ones initiating that conversation. 
What about marketing? Selling value. Like the passive generation of business. Okay. Help, help us understand what, what you mean by passive generation. You, you put it out there and so it's up to the customer or client to come into it. You're drawing okay. them in when you're prospecting, you're out dragging it in yourself. Yes, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. So I like to think of marketing as one to many, right? So it's one activity or one piece going out to a whole lot of people. And like you said, it should generate calls back, right? Or text back or whatever your call to action is. It should generate that. Whereas prospecting is that proactive one-to-one -one touch, right? Is prospecting better than marketing? Is marketing better than prospecting? Depends on where you are in your career. Yeah, that's a good point. There probably is a shift where you move from prospecting based and marketing enhanced to marketing based and prospecting enhanced, right? So it's probably the shift somewhere in there. And you kind of get to determine that for you. A lot of times it comes down to time, right? All right, leveraging database. Everyone's using a database, right? Please, okay, cool. Are we all using it really well or is it like an afterthought? Let's be honest, mine's an afterthought. I spent like half this morning just like catching up on notes. What about you? Why are you smiling? Uh, well, that's like my job is database. So I've, I feel like I've got it pretty good. But... You probably got it nailed. Yeah. Yep. All right, we talked about working with meth, which is anyone that you've had a substantive, substance-based conversation with two ways. We've talked about farming. Jason Massengill taught farming. What would you guys define farming as? Picking a location and focusing on marketing to them, feeding yeah. them information, to get them to know you. Yeah, so I always make fun of Jason because he loves Nixon and I hate Nixon. <laughs> For no other reason that it takes like two and a half hours to get from here to Nixa during rush hour. Like, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That 20, 27 stoplights. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well, it's not 27 <laughs> different stoplights. It's you're going to hit one, but you're going to go through three light cycles at that one, and then you'll get to the next stoplight. Right? So I joke with him, he's the queen of Nixa. Um, <laughs> We love Jason Massengill, but we just played, uh, we play our Bears Network has a softball team. So we play in an adult league, beer league softball team, and we're terrible, but we won. And we got on the field and I was just joking about with Josh as we drove by J one of Jason's listings that he's having a hard time selling because it's a piece of junk. It's not Jason's fault, right? But we get to the field and on the back wall of the field is a giant Jason Massengill sign, like Massengill group. And I was like, this guy is literally everywhere in Nixa. Like, I hate him, but he's awesome at it. Open houses. Brandy just did an open house. Who taught open houses? You guys remember? Nadri. Nadri. Oh, Nadri did. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, all good. I just set up to host an open house this Sunday. Awesome, David. Yeah, open houses are a huge source of business, guys. In this market, holy smokes, if you do it right, you're going to get a ton of visitors. Right. And when I say do it right, I just mean probably just host one at this point. Like it's literally that simple. But when I started my business, I was doing four open houses a weekend. And a lot, and that was back when we had listings. Right. So I had 30 listings to choose from. And so I just pick whatever listing I was going to go hold open, hold it open. And I would literally sit there and make phone calls at the open house because I wouldn't get any visitors. Right. Crazy. It's a whole different world now. Now you have to have your system set up, expect visitors. You got to know how to record their information. It's entirely different. Today is FISBOs and expired. And we're going to skip the what will make this a great training experience. And you are up, my friend. Awesome. So really, really basic. Uh, the, the topic for today is for sale by owners and expired. So who can start us off with what a for sale by owner, what a FISBO is? Just shout it out. Are they trying to sell them their house by themselves? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, show of hands and put in the chat for me. Um, does anyone have any experience, you know, dealing with for sale owners when it comes to selling their house or, or prospecting for sale by owner business? Okay. And then, <clears throat> is this something I, I believe we said earlier? Um, instead, it was not something that like we consistently do. So, is there a reason you kind of? You know, either shy away from it or it's not something that's a part of your like daily prospecting lead generate lead generation activities yes so if i'm familiar with the area and i see someone who has a fisbo sign up then i'm stopping i'm talking with them because you know i'm familiar and Absolutely. i know the market there sure. if i don't know the market so much i'll remember their number you know write down their number and kind of go do some research and then mm -hmm. pursue it okay that's pretty good yeah that's a that's a that's a great tactic for sure you had your hands up justin 
Yeah, I, uh, Circle Prospect. Uh, I'm sorry. I've I've gotten Fizbo lists and called them. Uh, uh, I don't think I've had any any uh, appointments set out of them though. Okay. What's kind of been your um, Brian? Can you, can you tell me a, like a, a takeaway from some of your uh, Fizbo stories that you've uh, been dealing with? And then you said you haven't had any you know success with setting appointments. What's kind of been the the common theme that you've kind of seen out of those conversations? Well, I was new. I, I think when I first started doing it, my scripting was too new. Probably didn't come off as um, knowledgeable, as confident as I should have. And uh, I could give it a second shot now. Yeah. I think now that I've had a little more experience. I believe you're absolutely right. Yeah. So um, I started for sale by owners. I believe. So I've been here a little over a year, almost a year and a half. I'd say I started probably right at a year ago. And it was something like amongst our team, we kind of divided up into, you know, um, like one half of our ISA team will call for sale by owners, the other half will call expires and cancels. And for sale by owners was something I just really took a liking to. You know, the the common theme is, you know, for sale by owners, the myth is that, you know, they're really straightforward, they're strict and mean, right? And my personality is more towards that, not saying I'm necessarily mean, but I'm not, I am mean, yeah. Um, not necessarily that I am uh, necessarily like that, but I'm not necessarily the uh, the fluffy, bright, huge personality guy. I'm very more direct and to the point, you know, come from contribution, how can I help? So everything's more straightforward and black and white with me. And I feel like, you know, for the most part, uh, without getting too stereotypical, for, for sale by owners are a lot of, of the same way. So that, I think that's part of why it took a great liking to them. Also, I mean, there's a lot of business to be had in it. Um, you can see here on, if you want to go to the next page for me, I think, just kidding, they don't have this on there. They've got uh, myth number one. So um, she Ryan, made, she Ryan made, just gave you some, some goodies in there. Awesome. So she made, she made a great point of for sale by owners are people who are trying to sell their houses without an agent. And that statement right there says nothing about not requiring the help of an agent to sell their house, right? Two different statements there. Absolutely. So, um, Whenever we have our initial conversations with for sale by owners, it is all about finding the value of where an agent can step in and be of assistance, you know? So those are things that are going to happen over the phone. And, you know, th that's in that needs discovery phase of how we can, how we can be of value to them. So Brian says he's listed some and sold some with uh, authorization to show on some others. Uh, some are matter realtors, but most are just trying to save money. For me, I think, uh, think of them as uh, kind of a pocket listing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and some of them are, are for sure that way. I know a lot of times whenever um, I'm having the conversation on the front end, um, you know, I'll go through a, a pretty standard like uh, script with Fizbo's is, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them, I'm trying to find out their motivation, you know, their timeline. Um, I'll set up, you know, ask them how they're doing showings, um, really, really basic stuff. And I say on the front end, hey, I'm trying to get some information so I can get it back to my team and some people I'm working with. Um, so I can see what we can do to get you an offer, right? Um, that can be interpreted a lot of different ways, but that's a really general blanket statement of why I'm calling and why, you know, I can be a value to them. That was really good. Can you repeat that again? Yeah. So in that initial conversation, uh, usually right on the phone, I'm saying, hey, you know, Mr. Seller, you know, I'm calling today. I want to get some information um, so I can bring it back to my team and some of the people I'm working with. Um, <coughs> my team and some of the people I'm working with um, so I can see what I can do to get you an offer, right? Again, that, that can be interpreted in many different ways, but um, during my conversation, I'm going to figure out where I can bring value to them. And we were going to talk about that a little bit later on, um, but towards the end of the conversation, once I built some rapport, I figured out a little bit more about them. I will try my very, very best, um, you typically towards the end of the conversation to ask, um, do you mind me asking, you know, Mr. Seller, um, why did you go, decide to go for sale by owner? Was it mostly commission or was there another reason? Now, there, there, are, some, uh, there are some stats on like this next page of, as far as why um, for sale by owners decided to go FISBO. And it says that first one, it's 47% that they did not want to save commission. In my experience, that is like 99%. And I totally get it, you know, and, and that's what I tell them. I said, I completely understand, you know, wanting to try and save them money, absolutely. Um, the reason I will ask it in that certain way in that initial conversation is, you know, um, was it mostly to save on commission or is there another reason? Because I pretty much know it's to save commission. I'm trying to understand if there's something, something deeper, something, um, a bigger reason um, at stake as to why they decide to try it on their own. A lot of times they're like, you know, I, you know, it's, it's mostly to save on money, right? I'm just going to be frank with you. I, I want to save on commission. 
you know, it's a great market right now, and I, I don't believe I need the help of uh, help of realtor. Hey, absolutely get it. Other times, it's you know, actually, I, I dealt with a realtor in the past. Um, I didn't have the, the best experience with them. And at that point, now you've uncovered an objection that you can now handle, right? We've all kind of been through these objections of, you know, how we can handle different ones. And unless I, you know, started off with, was it commission or was there another reason? I might not have uncovered that. If I had just said, was it mostly commission? Then I'd be like, yeah, it was. And I would have never known that they had a poor experience with a realtor in the past. So um, there's a lot of scripting that goes into for sale by owners. And I believe Justin's probably a lot more confident talking to him now when he first started. And because I know I am, I was really nervous to make calls. I would go into a little cubby and make my calls there because I didn't want to hear everyone hear me mess up. Um, he would hear my, you know, less than a year in talking to for sale by owners, which the pre-call bias is, you know, they're selling their house on their own because they're experienced, right? They've sold dozens of houses in the past. They've done it a million times. And I'm a 22 year old kid, first year in real estate. What do I know? How can I, be, how can I be of value to them? And that is a huge mindset shift of, of course I can be a value to them. I'm on the best team here in Springfield, right? There's so much value we can bring to them. First off, we could list it and, and bring more marketing to them than they've ever seen before. They have some of the worst listings by themselves. I mean, they post on one website. Sometimes it's Facebook Marketplace and that's it. I'm like, well, so we need we need more exposure for one. Two, I mean, it's, it's super easy to get things on our contract, right? Um, you know, in this market, but is it more important for you to sell it on your own or is it more important for you to get the best offer out there? And then, you know, that's what our marketing is going to do. Um, and then, I mean, obviously we've seen more fall through than ever before. And that's something our team, we see, we see every single day, you know, we look at contracts every single day. So if something's going to come up, our team is going to be the one that's going to hold it together where, you know, you've got a full-time job, you've got a wife and child at home, you've got hobbies, you've got all these things that are taking time away from you focusing on your house. Why would you not leave it up to a professional? Yeah. That's great. It's so interesting too. You you said one thing there that I was like, dang, I've never thought of that. Is your questions isn't to figure out what their main objection is, it's to figure out what their objections are. Overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had never thought of that. I always just resort to pay commission. Great, well, let me mark up your house and sell it because this market's insane. Like the easy, and then they like, no. You're like, what? Well, it might be right here. Their agent wasn't able to sell the home. We didn't even realize it was an old expired listing, right? Or they couldn't find a suitable agent. How funny is that one? Well, maybe they're older and maybe, you know, they don't get the newspaper anymore. I don't know. Like when was the last time you saw an agent on a TV ad? Like never radio every once in a while, but it's on like pop stations or country stations. So there could be an entire demographic that's not being reached inside of these numbers and we think it's money but really they're just isolated somehow or maybe they just never looked right but they went to Lowe's they saw the for sale by owner sign and then saw them. oh cool right try I'll it. do it yeah yeah I, we've even had them and, and this was actually one of my best clients who's now done tons of repeat business with me was a for sale by owner called me they were referred to me they went for sale by owner they called me they had three contracts they didn't know what to do Think about that. It's not that they, they can't get offers. Sometimes they don't know what to do with the offers. They don't know how to evaluate them. They don't know the process. So then I stepped in, helped them transact that one. Then they bought with me, sold, bought, sold, bought, sold, bought three investment properties as well over four years. It's like incredible, right? So that was super good. It's not just money. What other motivations? That was yeah, huge. Because I get to the point where towards the end of the conversation where I'm like, hey, I think you've got a price really well. I because we deal in such volume, I don't want to spend too much time on the front end doing a ton of research. I just want to pick up the phone and dial. I want to uncover these objections and I can you know, get market data and information later. Um, as far as um, you know, price goes, as far as price goes, I just say, hey, I think you've got a price really well. That's it. I say, hey, you got a price really well. Did you have comps or did someone kind of help you with, um, or did someone help you with comps or did you have an appraisal on it recently? Is that just kind of what you need out of it? Um, the reason I ask about comps, this is a great one is because I want to see if they have a realtor that they've used. Right. So they're like, yeah, my, my sister-in-law, Becky, um, she ran comps for me. Great. Noted in my head. Right. So clearly she's selling, you know, uh, Fisbo selling their house by themselves. They have a sister-in-law realtor. I'm going to wrap back to that later. Right. I'm going to follow up and be like, Hey, I know you mentioned just a minute ago, you had, you know, Becky, your, your sister-in-law was, uh, was a real estate agent. Do you mind me asking why you didn't list with them? Uh, well, I just figured, you know, the market's so great, I could sell it on, you know, sell it on my own. 
it would take a little bit farther. It's like, okay, so so it's important for you to make the most amount of money on this on the sale of your home. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I totally get that. And you know, I don't want to cut into what you're looking to net. I don't want to cut into what you're looking to net, but I also don't want commission to be the reason we don't get to help. So if we can end up making you more money, if we can end up making you more money, since that is what you told me was the most important thing to you, is there any other reason you wouldn't be opposed to working with us on it? And then you're going to get more of these. Yeah. And, and these are really just like open-ended questions. Like I, I'm not like asking for them to listen to me right away because I'm not promising anything. I, I, I haven't read any numbers. I haven't met with them. There's a lot of things to it. It's just a question, right? Uh, thought provoking is like, Hey, you just told me that making the most amount of money on this sell your house was important to you. You told me earlier in the conversation, you're moving to, you know, the lake, you need as much money as you can for a down payment. It's a great market for it. I want as much money as possible for you. And the reason you're selling by yourself is so you can capitalize on, you know, how much money you're taking away from it. Is that correct? Yes. Is there any other reason besides money and commission that you would sell it on your own? Then, you know, list with a realtor. Yes or no, right? I'm isolating that objection and seeing what else there might be. Because um, potentially, yeah, they say they have a real estate agent sister-in-law, but maybe she's brand new to it too, right? Maybe she's been in it two months and she doesn't feel comfortable going with them. Maybe they just had a, a fight over Easter and they're not on speaking terms. You never know, right? So it's really tough. I still find myself in this situation of whenever I feel like, I was like, oh, they've got a sister-in-law agent, ask for business, right? It's like, hey, if we can, you know, if we can get around your objection, you know, it's important for you to make the most amount of money possible. If we can still accomplish these things, is there any other reason you wouldn't work, want to work with someone like us? Um, a lot of times, you I mean, you're going to get some different answers, but you won't uncover these other objections unless you ask something like that. And for me, being really black and white, you know, I was thinking to myself, 90% of the time, it's, it's commission, right? So I'm like, great, easy solve. I mean, you've got no commission factored in, we'll slap 6% on top, we'll market it. And I'm like, great, can we do that? And they say no. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like, what am I missing, right? And that happens all the time. It still happens. And I got to think to myself, what am I missing? I didn't ask a question somewhere along our conversation um, that would lead me to the result I want. So I got to you know, turn to myself and think, you know, what better questions could I have asked along the way to uncover objections that I'm, I'm clearly missing here? What's so good about a quick question. Are you having all of these conversations that we're just talking about on the phone before you set an appointment? Or yeah. you're just trying to do is the minimal amount of conversation you need in order for them to agree to meet with you. Like, which is the tactic? Are you trying to extract everything on the phone? Or if you just talk to them and they say, yeah, I'm open to meeting with you. I mean, are you stopping then and just saving the rest of it for your, for your actual meeting? I get as much as I possibly can on the front end. And then when, if I set the appointment and the, the agent goes on it, they're going to, they'll read over my notes, but they're going to do the exact same thing I just did on the phone, but they're going to do it in person. They know that I got the motivation. They know I got the timeline. They know I got the price. They know, I, they know I've got this information. And then whenever they come here, they're going to say, yeah, Christian told me a little bit about what you, what you guys are going to do next. Um, he said, you guys mentioned you're going to the lake. You tell me like, have you guys already found something? So they're going to build rapport, right? They're going to find out more than information in person. On the front end, I'm going to equip them as best as I can with as much information as I can. Obviously, I want to get the appointment. And on top of that, I want to set expectations of why we're going to be there. I know whenever I first started, the biggest thing was um, I want to make sure to set expectations of you're going to be meeting with a listing agent to talk about listing your home. Obviously, there's more value we can bring to you besides just listing. But I don't want them thinking that we're sending an agent out and then they show up to the door and they're like, where's your buyer? I didn't, I didn't want to set our agents up for success like that. So, so having a good conversation around what value we can bring and saying, you know, Hey, if we can still bring you an offer that nets you what you need to out of it, you know, is there any other reason you wouldn't work with us? They say, no, great. I want to send an agent out to talk to you about what we can do to get you an offer. Uh, in your situation and specifically that context, what I would do, and I'm not Christian, so because he's the master at this stuff. But if they said, yeah, I have no problem meeting you, I'd go ahead and book an appointment there. And then I'd be like, I got a few more questions for you before we come out. Yeah. And then you might go ahead and dig into some of the more motivating timelines. Yes. So in other words, if they're, if they're eager to book, the point of the phone call is to book the appointment. The point of the appointment is to get signed paperwork. But everything else that goes around it determines whether or not it's going to be a successful transaction or a nightmare, right? 
So the point of the phone call is to get appointment and then we get prequal or we get prequal then appointment, right? But if they offer to meet, absolutely. Tuesday at two work for you, great, fantastic. We'll be there. A few more things before we jump off the phone. Okay. Perfect, I'm sorry, I, must, I misunderstood your question. That's exactly it. So if they're like, sometimes they will say like early in the conversation, like, yeah, you know, I can meet you out there, you know, um, this afternoon at two, does that work with you guys? Yep, perfect, <laughs> two o'clock, I'll be there. Yeah. Be like, awesome, we'll, you know, we'll meet you out there at two o'clock, and before we meet you, I've got a couple more questions, right? And I know you said you're, you know, moving to the lake soon, like, have you guys already found something, right? Is your purchase contingent upon the sale of this home? Um, like, some other things like that to try and qualify the appointment a little bit better, so we have an idea of what we're walking into, but 100%, yes, I've booked the appointment first, because you can always cancel it, reschedule it, whatever, book it, and then a lot of times, like, we'll book it, and we're fortunate enough to be on a great team where we've got like a little row of hens just making calls, but <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll like turn around. And I'm like, guys, yeah, I just had this physical conversation. It's weighing on me. I need to talk about it. It is such like a useful resource being able to like script with someone, talk about what just happened. And, you know, then I get a you know voice out loud. Like, is this appointment worth setting? Did I set expectations? Do we know why they're out there? Or why we're coming out there. So that is a great resource that I'm, you know, very for, um, very glad that we have. Um, but yes, set the appointment, qualify later, um, and then you can kind of go from there. But let me let me take that just a little step further. Like I get how working for a team, it's important to to have clear expectations because the person that goes out and meets with them in person is not you who talk to them on the phone. But as an individual agent, if I'm calling someone. And I'm going to be the one that's there. I mean, in my mind, I would rather have any conversation with anyone about buying something directly face to face. Like that is my goal way ahead of talking to someone on the phone or, or any other way. So it's, you know, I'm, I mean, I guess if, I guess your point though, that you made of once they've agreed to the appointment, you still ask them a few more questions. I mean, you still have the appointment, but at least you have a better idea. I guess I'm talking myself out of it. But as I'm talking, but I guess you know, I guess the more information you can go, the more prepared you could be to have a better conversation when you're face to face. I guess it's both. So and yeah, in the context of the team, when you're sending someone else, super important pre qual. I would argue that, and even when I was an individual agent doing this, I tended to operate like your initial thought there is. I'd rather have the appointment in person. What I did is I went on a real a ton of really unqualified appointments. So I would waste, I'd have, you know, 10 appointments that month and I would sign two of them and I'd call my coach frustrated. Like I can book the appointment. Why aren't I getting them? And he'd say, okay, start recording your calls. And the calls would be, Hey, I might have a buyer for your property or whatever the actual context of the call was, whatever script I used, I would get to the appointment booked. And I'd say, great. See you at two. Right. And I'd be there at two, not realizing that they've already signed listing paperwork with someone else or which that happened to me a bunch back in the day, or it would be, well, I'm definitely not going to sign with you. Your script said that you might have someone interested, but only you came out here. I didn't, I wasn't getting enough out of the person to make the appointment worthwhile. So in other words, when you are able to prequal a little bit more, that appointment is way more effective. Because again, the point of the call is the appointment, but the point of the appointment is the signature. So you can use the call to set up for the signature. And you're right, at the appointment though, we're confirming all of their motivations, we're making sure our timeline's right, and then we're gonna go into, this is why you're choosing me as your agent and what we're gonna do, and sign here, press hard, 3% plus transaction fee, right? That's the whole idea, is you're totally right, is in person, I'm way better than on the phone, but I'm really bad in person if I haven't set myself up appropriately on the phone. Well, and if, if they're just adamantly opposed to listing and they're not going to list, then why waste your time right. going to their house? Right. right. But, and if you don't ever discover that, you do what Wes does and you go to these. I mean, I remember one is 780,000. His name's Jeff Lehman. I see him twice a week now. And he just added me on Facebook this morning, ironically. I went on three FISBO appointments. They were all his house. I didn't know it, it was all LLC owned. So I was calling, just skip tracing the LLC and calling the number and not realizing I was calling the same guy. And I went three times with, there. And the second one was, hey, I have a buyer who might be interested. And I did. And I showed up and he was there. And I was like, oh, no. Had I known it was him, I would have never even like gone. And of course, nothing came out of it. And so now it's this ongoing joke. Every I see him every Sunday. 
Um, and every Sunday he's like, still can't sell my houses. <laughs> and I'm like, Ugh, you suck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's just part of it. It sounds like a really great learned lesson though. Right. From you. I mean, it took time and effort and energy. For sure. And that uh, thorough pre-qualification of, of FISBO is like, I think talked about it in shift where it's like, you got to use the thin bait and then the fat bait, like the thin bait to get the uh, appointment set up in the fat bait to make sure that they're actually worth it. So you can convert them uh, yeah. and make, and get them as you know, signed, signed to the seller. All right. Yeah. And I think honestly, to start, if you are very, very, very new to for sub owners, I honestly think it's okay. I mean, if, I would rather the time be spent doing something like that, meeting with someone in person mm -hmm. and figuring out where those holes are and then thinking, okay, because I do the same thing. So like, if I set an appointment for like Wes to go on, he comes, he, go, he goes on and comes back and he tells me how it went. And let's say he didn't get the business. Um, I want to know like why, right? So he'll tell me like A, B, and C. And now I'm taking that information. I'm going like right back to my thought process of, okay, what could I have asked on the front side to maybe have, you know, uncovered that? or maybe mentioned it earlier, like I want to get better at it. So, but I wouldn't have known that necessarily unless he goes on it. So it is kind of that fine balance. I think you're going to get to the point eventually where you're going to want to be as well-rounded on the front side to save yourself time. Obviously it's the whole point of being want to be as efficient and, you know, as maximized as possible without wearing ourselves out. And I think you're going to end up being at the point where you want as much information on the front edge as you can. So that way you go in person and it's like, Hey, yeah, here you go. Like, and I love doing that. I know I've got tons more now than I used to. And I, I think to myself, I'm like, well, what's the difference? I'm like, it's scripting, 100%. It's I'm asking those questions on the front end, setting expectations of what we're actually there to do. So whenever we're there, we kind of bring them up again. It's like, well, hey, we've kind of talked about objections A, B, and C. You know, here's objection, handl uh, objection handlers A, B, and C. You know, what other objections do you have? Nothing, great. You know, I'd love to sell your house and get you on your motivation. Like, let's do this. So it's a much easier pass and, and it's a uh, much higher conversion, right? And saves you much more time. If you can be more well-rounded on the phone on the front side, so that way it's, it's a layup whenever you get there. Does that make sense? Can I, add, can I add to that? And our conversation here is making me think more about it. So do you guys know how much a, like the average Facebook lead costs running Facebook leads through command? It's 86 cents, right? Now, out of 200 Facebook leads, you might convert one might to an appointment, not to close, to an appointment, right? So you're gonna end up spending a lot of money for a lot of unqualified leads. Well, do you know how much Op City charges when they do a direct connect with a hot lead ready to meet with an agent? 38%. 38% of your commission. <laughs> Jeez, dude. Think about that. So the only difference between the two leads is one is really pre-qualified, ready to rock and roll, and the other one's not at all. Like we get leads like doo doo head and poop toilet through our Facebook leads, right? <laughs> like it, it's just absolute garbage sometimes. But then when an op city lead comes in, they need to talk to an agent. They're ready to do something. And the difference is, is they were pre qualified on the phone or they were nurtured over time to the point where they're ready to transact. So then they can charge agents a fortune for them. And agents are gladly taking them because, hey, uh, 50 or 62% is better than zero, you know, it's crazy. That's really the only difference. And so when I think about the pre-qualifying scripts, I tend to think of, well, there's more value to that appointment, right? People will pay 38% pre-qualified once they've been pre-qualified. Yeah. Pre yeah. And so, yeah, hitting motivations, basic motivations, timeline, that kind of thing is going to be the biggest. Do you have an agent and all that? One other quick question, slightly off topic. Whenever someone has their FISBO advertised and it's got their phone number, there's no worry about them being on the do not call list, right? Because they're they're asking people to call. Exactly right. It's a public advertisement. Okay. Yep. You're good to go. Burn their phone down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Wear them down so someone gets the listing. Right. Are you ready to keep going here? Yeah. We're about to introduce, you know, expireds and, and uh, canceled. Um, chat, or do you guys have anything else on FISBOs before we kind of introduce the next topic? We'll go deeper in depth with some of this. Yeah, for sure. We got a lot of content here. Uh, but yeah, so the next thing, um, expireds and withdrawn listings, but you know, withdrawns in our market are temporary off markets, correct? Yeah, so well, hold on. Our market has temporarily off market, 
we can't call those people. That means they still have a listing in place, right? right? A full withdrawn or canceled. I don't even think we have withdrawn anymore. I think it's just canceled. Cancels are what we can call it. Right. So this is going to say withdrawn. What it means is canceled in our MLS. And other MLSs withdrawn means they don't have a listing agreement anymore. In ours, they called it temporarily off market. Right? Don't call temporarily off market. Canceled and expires. So the listing agreement's not there, but they still have an agent? So temporarily off market means it'd be like, uh, okay, I put my house on the market and then something happened in the house, like a uh, hailstorm and we had to get a roof replacement. Ah. So I'm gonna temporarily take it off okay. the market. I still have my agreement with my listing agent in place. I'm gonna fix the roof, clean it up, then get it back on market. A canceled is I'm canceling my listing agreement. So those ones are free game. Also, there is a little bit of an unwritten rule inside of KW that we typically don't you know, target other KW agents cancels. You can, there's nothing illegal about it, but it's just something that we typically don't do. What I like to do is make sure that we contact whoever that other agent was and say, hey, we've talked to Justin. Justin wants to sell his house. Is that okay? And most of the time they're like, oh yeah, I couldn't sell it. You know, but it's just one of those cultural pieces that can sometimes help. Awesome. So um, we just kind of talked about it, but someone tell me again, kind of what an expired listing is. Just make sure we're all on the same page. Ooh, that's a, that's a different question. Expired listing is just it's ran its time frame. If that it listed for 90 days, the 90 days is up. Perfect. Yep. And then so what's the difference between that and then a, a canceled listing? Customer decides he doesn't want to sell it anymore or Absolutely. it doesn't want to work out. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, yeah, again, this is this is another part of our business that we we incorporate every single day. Um, again, the, these aren't like um, he 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 mentioned. You know, we we try not to call other Keller Williams, um, you know, expireds because it's just part of a cultural piece. Totally get it. And at the same time, like they're just conversations, right? If they are do have a great relationship with the realtor, hey, I mean, I'm not trying to be pushy at all. I'm just calling and say, hey, I saw you're off the market. I was sending you out to some some clients I was working for. I just wasn't um, interested if you guys were still interested in selling. Um, and it's a really just a conversation from there as far as like what happened. I just I just want to know what happened because obviously I see it's a, a canceled after 10 days on market. Like what what's going on? Is this something I can still bring back to my buyers? Because we all know we need inventory. So is this something I can still send out to my team and bring some value? Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? Um, so we've got this next slide of why houses do not sell. So we've got three main reasons why a house does not sell. Can you guys tell me what these three reasons might be? I know, I was afraid you're gonna do that. <laughs> okay, I'd say like major, major structural problems, um, inspection report findings. Okay, so condition? Overpriced. Overpriced, absolutely. Condition price location. location. So I knew we were going to say location. So I wrote down location as number four. It's got um, how well it's marketed, right? And this is this is extremely important, especially when we're talking about expireds and um, for sale by owners. Is I mean that's extremely important. We talk about for sale by owners only being on Fisbo.com. Well, I don't even know how to look at Fisbo.com. Like I, I just want to do it every day, and I'm not even really sure how to look at it. So that's really tough. Marketing is extremely important. We've seen some poorly, you know, photographed listings, you know, on our MLS, really poor descriptions. And as Keller Williams as a whole, we do a much better job than that. But there are obviously agents out there who do not market properties as well as we do. So we've all seen them. Okay, just as a rule, if I ever see anyone or anyone on the chat take cell phone photos of a house oh. worth more than 30 grand, awesome. I'm going to lose it. I will call you and public or not publicly, privately shame you. It's a hundred dollars and it is the number one largest marketing piece, tool, whatever to get a listing sold. It's just the easiest thing ever. Like, please. When I started and 30 grand's the cutoff. So 20, yeah. 20, 99, nine, we're good. Well, like if you think about it, right, there are some properties, I'm probably 50 grand in this market, That's but it's like, you're like, I don't even want to get near the house. So I'm doing the drive by listing photo out the window with my cell phone, like acceptable. I get it. It's terrible condition. There's like three homeless dudes and a dead cat in there. <laughs> we're good. But then, you know, when you're actually looking to support um, a good owner occupant home, please spend the hundred bucks. It's the best return ever. You'll get way better internet traction on it and you'll get more leads from it. So 
Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I just get so like, are you kidding me? You pick them and they get cell phone photos. <laughs> Um, so on this next slide, we, uh, slide we've got like the, the do not call list. We touched on it just a minute ago, but like Wes was talking about, it's publicly um, advertised. So feel free to call them until they sell or die or whatever. But <laughs> sell or die. Yeah. Wow. But but so that does this hold true on expireds or not? Or they we can't call them if they're not on the expired. You may not. If so, they're on the do not call that's list. You right. Can't call so them. expireds and canceled listings, if they're DNC, you cannot call them. So feel free to go in there. I believe KW has a login for it. You can scrub against it. If you use any sort of dialing system, it will auto scrub the numbers you have plugged in. But the, the big piece on these two is they actually hired a representative, right? Whereas the FISBOs didn't. So they're publicly advertising themselves. These, these two did not. Okay, let me believe you're up. Oh, I'm up. Let's go. All right. So one thing I want to talk about to you guys today, this is MREA right behind you here, Christian. You got the two triangles. I teach this in every class, right? Do you guys remember the two triangles from week five or section five? Yeah. Okay, what was the bottom of the triangle? S and M. It's models, wow. right? Mm -hmm. Models. What was the top? Creativity. Creativity. Yeah. And likewise, if it's upside down, what happens to our triangle? goes from being stable to unstable. Yeah. So everything we're talking about so far is this awesome solid foundation and model around FISBAs and expires. So every script you hear today, all the content we're talking about is model, model, model. Splash in your creativity, guys. Like Christian said, hey, this is who I am. I'm very direct and very black and white. I feel like a lot of these people are, so I communicate that way. Well, I'm not as black and white as Christian. I paint in rainbow colors, right? So my my model might have to adapt to my personality a little bit more, right? Now, what I'm not allowing us to do is have this limiting belief around whether or not we can or can call, convert, and sell expired business, right? So that's myth number two on page 17. Let's see if we have a slide for that. This myth that you can only succeed with FISBOs and expired slash canceled is by being aggressive and direct. That's not true at all. The way you succeed with them is by number one, making contact with them. And then number two, being yourself in a manner that sets you apart, right? That's our creativity. So Brandy, you're a great example of this. You're like, I wanna know the area before I make the call. It's not that you didn't make the call. It's that you knew, you know who you are, you know what value you bring, and so you utilize those things on the call. It's not that you didn't make the call, it's that you understood yourself enough to get you to make that call. The other piece on creativity that I love is, while FISBOs are great, oh, Brian, Brian, just being classic Brian Jackson, he says, I love to have my finger in the photos pointing out the features. <laughs> like the inspector, the inspector's like, yeah. daylight under the door. <laughs> it's Brian. <laughs> Love that guy. So your creativity around your follow-up on a lot of these leads is just as important as making the initial call sometimes. So in other words, on that first call, don't be discouraged if you didn't convert them right away. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. So while Christian is an absolute monster at getting us in the door for these appointments, at the same time, his follow-up game has to be equally as strong. Right, just like any PPC lead, any met, any of that. So, we talked about in that section five the eight by eight and the 36 touch have a custom built program, an eight by eight for a uh, for sale by owner or an expired canceled listing. Right, and that includes that can include sending them a little goodie bag, it could include sending them a refrigerator magnet, a recipe card, it could be a system of calls or texts. Right. You can get really creative with that kind of thing. It could be a CMA. It could be a market update. Get creative as you want to be and, and keep it like yourself. So like if I send someone a recipe card, they're going to be like, no way in hell would I make that because they know I can't cook. Right. However, with FISBOs, they don't necessarily know you. So your eight by eight on your FISBO or your expired really needs to be tailored to you. Does that make sense? It's so funny that we think of these folks as different than like a PPC lead or a Facebook lead 
or obsolete. Like these are all the same people. Like it's all people, right? It's not like they're a magical new breed of people that are like extremely mean or don't like us, right? They're the same people getting on Zillow and clicking on stuff and landing in other people's databases. It's like, these are, they're all people, right? So just the way we're going to follow up with them needs to be you. So again, um, we come from contribution, we establish trust, and we stay in touch. So we're bringing them value. We're establishing trust in them. Obviously, Christian's talked a lot about our team. You know what the number one downfall of the team is? A lot of times it's not the agent who's going to help them actually talking to them. As simple as that is like when I hire a financial advisor, I want to work with that financial advisor. I don't want to work with his cronies, right? Yet, so for a lot of individual agents, they look at teams like, oh my gosh, they're so big. They like eat up so much of the market. Well, the reality is there's a massive, huge pool of people that would rather not work with a team. See what I'm saying? So, so your uniqueness, your coming from contribution, establishing uh, trust and staying in touch is what ends up separating you from them. Does anyone have any questions about that? Does it help to think about for sales by owners basically the same as a PPC lead? All right. If you could, just drop them into your database and call them just like every other lead. Why not? You know, put them on the same drip plans and follow-up campaigns as everyone else. You know, customize it for you. Say, hey, this is the lead source. So I know my first eight weeks have to be a little bit different. Then they're going on the same follow-up plan as, you know, poop toilet that came through the Facebook lead ad, right? So that's a real one, isn't it, Christian? It is a real one. That is a real one. Okay. Here's the opportunities. We're going to touch on these a million points here as quick as I can. That way we can get you guys out. Six ways to win, right? Number one, get the listing. Duh, right? I'm going to go ahead myself. No, 19. There we go. We're going to talk about all the ways we can win through these. This is what's really unique. We always think that to win a FISBO, it's number one, right? We think that's just the only way we're going to get anything out of them. But the reality is we can get the listing, find a buyer for the house. We can help the seller buy a new home nearby. That's a great one. If you sell your house here, who's helping you find your next house? Exactly. This is, this is so important. So well, when, it, when it comes to like coming from contribution, that's, that's the reason why we're calling. Obviously, our main objective is to get the listing. However, if we can take ourselves out of that conversation for just a second and imagine like, obviously, like you said, this is a PVC lead. How can we help this person? We are the expert, right? We're the expert. They have plans in real estate. So how can I be a value to them? Obviously, if we can get the listing and help them get their house sold, clearly that's what they're trying to do. However, there's more things to it, right? More things to their objection, more things to their motivation, more things to their timeline. So it's our job to figure out what those things are and how we can help. So these are great ways to, uh, again, and it comes full circle. So if they're, they're if you can do one of these things, two through six, and they haven't sold yet, guess who's going to be the first person that they, they turn to to help sell their house? This market's a little bit different and it just moves a lot faster. So the follow-up plan like isn't how it used to be. However, if they sit long enough, I mean, if they have plans to sell and they're overpriced or the house needs work or whatever, if the house hasn't sold and you can help them do two through six, huge chance you're getting number one. Mm-hmm. Huge chance you're getting number one. So let me walk through a couple of these and give you how I spin them, the classic West ways of figuring out deals. Number one, get the listing. That's pretty straightforward, okay? Number two, find a buyer for the house. What if you don't have a buyer for the house? Because how many times do you call the FISBO like, we don't want to work with you, but we'll offer 3% for a buyer's agent? It's like, great, I want the 3%, so let's figure this out, right? So what if you don't actually have a buyer for that house? What are some ways you could get a buyer for a specific home? Prospecting? Yeah, you could prospect for it. You can circle call that area. Who do you know? Hi, Mr. Neighbor. Who do you know that wants to live in your neighborhood? I have an upcoming opportunity for a home near you. How simple is that script, right? That's a great one. My personal favorite, and I used to do this all the time, is I'd find a FISBO and I would get to my Facebook page and I would literally post on the general page and then every other community page I could find that said something along these lines. So you can't use an address and you can't call it an off-market listing, right? So let's say it's a three bedroom, two bath in the columns. The columns is in Nixa, right? Because we're on a Nixa train today. I don't know why, <laughs> can't wait to get off of it. But, so it's in the columns. It's a super popular neighborhood. They've got community pages. They've got all kinds of stuff. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post to the general populace and to those 
communities, I'm going to say, I have an opportunity for a home or a buyer, or I'm looking for a buyer for a home in the columns. It's a smaller house. Who do you know that's looking, right? Now, inevitably, you're going to get people who are like, oh, this person, this person, they're going to be working with agents. Sorry, we can't work with them. They have an agent. Right, but you're also potentially going to get leads off that, and if you don't get leads off that, you're going to get attention off that. So that's a really good thing is when you're posting these opportunities, people think that you have listings, they like to work with you. You become this agent of choice in your communities, right? So I love doing that. You do that with every single FISBO out there, right? There's not a single FISBO that that little simple script wouldn't work. I have an opportunity for blah blah blah. Right. And if an agent calls and goes, Hey, I want to know more about the opportunity. Great. Is this for sale by my owner over here? You know, or you can just say, Oh, sorry. They said no listing agents, or they said they won't pay a buyer's agent information, whatever you want to say. Right. It's not your listing. So just tell them it's not my listing, but it's an off market opportunity. Number three, help them find a home nearby. That's an easy one. We already talked about that. Refer the seller to another agent for out of town moves. That's an awesome one. Like I'm going down to the lake. If you don't sell the lake, refer them to a lake agent right then. Don't wait for their house to close. Say, great, I'm going to connect you with the best lake agent I know. And then you're going to call a lake agent and say, hey, Kim Hagen, this is Justin's phone number. He's looking for a house on the lake. He's trying to sell for sale by owner over here. I'm attempting to get that listing. If you'll team up with me, I want to make sure you get the referral. So you close the business. I'll take the referral fee. And then likewise, if you get them to list with me, I'll pay you a referral fee. Why not swap some business with that next agent, right? That's a big one. Uh, actually, that, I did that one accidentally um, in Arlington, Tennessee. It was actually a friend of mine who had listed for sale by owner. He called me and said, hey, we're moving. I need an agent. I was like, are you going to sell your house? He's like, yeah, well, we're thinking about it. I didn't realize it was already on. So, oh, sweet. And I referred him to Arlington and that agent closed them in Arlington. And then she basically convinced them to list with me here. It was awesome. It's a total accident, but it's a great move. New <laughs> potential customers by offering to host open houses. This is an important one. Make sure you get the proper documentation there. I believe it's an authorization to market. It's not show. It's an authorization, permission to, I don't know. There's some document that Jim Bolin knows about that you're going to need to get signed. Okay. <laughs> The other thing you can do there is instead of uh, just offering to host the open house with uh, permission to show or advertise or whatever it is, you can offer them an off-market 24-hour listing. So on the day of your open house, there's an off-market 24-hour listing. So non-MLS, non-Zillow, none of that, right? And so you have the listing for 24 hours, right? And it's exclusive for those 24 hours. Okay. You explain that a little bit more. It's just your listing paperwork. And then in special agreements, this is to remain off market, blah, blah, blah. There's a writer that the MLS gives you to keep it off of the MLS. So you just fill that form out and it's just literally a 24 hour listing period. And what's the, what's the point of that? So that you can host the open house or you okay. can do 24 hours of advertising on the home. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you do get a buyer, from, if you do get a buyer, do you get a commission on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you have the 3% listing. Yep. So you still have a listing contract with them, so you can define what your cost is going to be on it. But that used to be really popular before the seller's market was this crazy. But back when we had like two months of supply inventory, which was still a deep seller's market, we used to use that quite a bit. Number six, help the seller write up the business if they find a buyer for a negotiated commission. This is That's a good one. Now keep in mind that could fall under transaction brokerage. We don't transaction broker. We represent people, right? So transaction brokerage is not allowed in this brokerage unless you are a broker, right? And it's transaction brokerage, not transaction agent. We are buyer's agents and seller's agents. So we use the actual listing agreements to represent people. So you would represent a single party in this case, but you would just assist with the other party. So you might represent the buyer and assist with the FISBO. You might represent the seller and assist with the buyer. Does that make sense? For a pre-negotiated commission on that. Yeah. Um, and just to touch on this one more time, I, I know I just said a few minutes ago, but again, these are the more fun conversations and more fun people to help. So, so often, especially in this market, talking with FISBOs who are advertising their home for sale way over like 
even close to fair market value, way over top dollar, just blasphem like blasphemous. It's ridiculously high. And those are so tough. When all the motivation I can get out of it is trying to take advantage of the market, this is what I'm selling for or nothing. That's hard. How am I supposed to win, right? Hey, I want as much money for this for you too. And what would you do next if you get that number, right? And it, it, it's so hard to have those conversations and, and to actually do something with those. Those aren't as fun. They're, those are really, you know, can weigh heavily on you. But if you could find someone where you can be a resource for them, right? They need someone to help them find a house because they're struggling as a buyer, right? They're, they're selling and obviously going to go buy something else. If you can find something for them to buy, if you can refer them to another agent who can help them out in that market, if you can be the expert in the market, um, the market specialist and find a way to be a value for them, everything comes full circle. And those are more fun. You get to be a better agent for it. You know, you sleep better at night. Like all those, it checks off so many boxes because you can do these extra things besides just here, let me take an overpriced listing. Yeah. Com completely the millionth truth. You know what the best part about FISBOs and expireds are though? The lead costs you nothing, right? So if you have six ways to make money on that person or that client, and they don't cost you a dime. Like Facebook has even 86 cents a lead times 200 to get an appointment. Here it's free times a couple to get an appointment. What I mean, like it's insane. Like all the time we're tracking ROI on leads. So we're spending this, what are we getting? We're spending this, what are we getting? We do that literally every lead source all the time. This one, we don't have to. We just have to track what we're getting. Yeah, there's no cost. It's perfect. It's my favorite lead source. Other than open houses, I like open houses alone. Well, I think also if you help a seller find a home to buy that they're interested in, I think that would also increase their motivation to sell their home quickly. A million percent. Heck yeah. A million yeah. percent. That was a great point. Can you say that again a little bit louder? <laughs> if you find, if you help a seller find a new home that they're interested in, you're going to increase their motivation to sell their current home. Which what separates, exactly. you know, that agent from a lot of other agents is like, are you going to actually find, help them find that home? Because I know a lot of times I'm like, it's a tough market. Like, I don't want it. Like what, what's in it for me? It's like, I mean, there's obviously work that needs to be done, but that's you're going to stand out, right? If you can find them some other options, you know, uh, some other off-market options for them, maybe other Facebook, who knows? There's a, a, an endless possibilities of how you can be different from every other agent out there. For one, you're calling, right? A lot of agents don't do that for one. Yeah. And two, you're coming from contribution. How can I help you besides, obviously, I can help you list your house and get it sold quicker for the, for the most money. Um, but also, there's other things to it besides those things. So let me help you out in some other ways. And... A lot of times they see it. They really do. If you can have like a genuine conversation, you know, you're complimenting on, on their house, you know, you're, you're interested in investing in, in what their plans are. A lot of times they'll answer your questions. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, if we can't make the numbers work, that's part of it. But I don't want commission, again, to be the reason we don't get a help. So what other ways can I be of value to you? And besides just, you know, I'm not that that commission, commission breath agent who's only after your listing and, and doing all these things like, hey, Yes, I obviously want to get paid for the work that I do, and I do a great job of it. But at the end of the day, I'm here to help people, and I know this is a really difficult market. So what can I do to be a service for you? So good. All right, guys, we're going to do a kind of interesting exercise. We did this back in Section 5, but on, nine, uh, no, on 22 and 23, you have two stories, okay? The first one is Diana Kikoska's story. She used to be the CEO of MAPS Coaching. She no longer is. Um, amazing. I took a bunch of her courses while she was still here. And then the next one is uh, Jean Grubb, who's another absolute monster when it comes to for sale by owners and expireds. What I want us to do is we're going to take one, two, three, four paragraphs. Can we read a paragraph a minute? All right, we're going to take four minutes to read page 22, Diana Kikoska's story. And I want you to pull out one or two things that you're like, oh, wow, that was really good. Okay. So go ahead and do so, and then we'll discuss them. I'm going to run to the restroom real quick.
remember what time I said four minutes from. <laughs> I checked and then didn't remember. You guys never got the opportunity to meet Diana Kokoska. She is this tall mm -hmm. and the most intense human being you've ever, like you get in the room with her and you're like, whoa, she is a force of nature, mm -hmm. which is why this is labeled the direct approach. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty intense at times, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's really good things in here and this might not be your style, but there are some really good things in here. So let's get at least three things that you might've pulled out. So go for it. She basically gives them the definition of insanity and makes them feel like it kind of calls them insane in a way. <laughs> Continue to do the same. Oh, <laughs> I don't think I'm that old. I don't I don't think you're right in the gut. If I, was, if I was like 4 11 and looked like her, I probably could have done that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, no, I can't pull that one off. But hey, maybe it works in here. So I don't know. <laughs> what else? I like how she just asks if she can be honest with them. Yeah, I like that. You know, I think that that opens the door for being honest with someone sure. about why they're ousted. So mm -hmm. nobody's going to say, no, I don't want you to be honest with me. I want you to lie. Nobody's going to say, I wanted you to lie to them. Well, I once upon a time took coaching skills camp. That was the old KW maps. Like it was like their master class is the best course I've ever taken out of any bar none. And you had to sit one on one with Diana and you had to do a five minute coaching conversation with her. And I butchered it like completely. And she was like, can I give you feedback? And I was like, yes. She goes, you never asked if you could coach me. And she goes, and also do you notice that I just asked you if I could give you feedback? So when you point out that, hey, can I be honest with you? That's them giving you permission. Like that's, that's a trust deposit. Right. That's the whole point of scripting is to get trust deposits. Right. So asking the permission, hey, can I coach you on that? And if they say no, respect them. Hey, can I be honest with you? I don't know. I don't think I'm interested. Okay, great. No problem. Like respect that answer. But it's super powerful. We don't realize it, but it's super powerful. That's really good. What else? Straightforward. Mm -hmm. Honest, straightforward. Yeah. Hey, she didn't really embellish much, right? She's like, I'm going to call you till either I die or you tell me to stop or you die. <laughs> That's a Christian thing. She just said, let's just get together. Let's get together tonight. She didn't ask them right. about it. But she said, let's get together tonight. I can be there. Let's do it. You know? Yeah. I love the idea of the second opinion. Like if you're getting surgery, you get a second opinion, right? Like this is basically financial surgery for you. Like yeah, but to me, that seems just slightly sleazy. They, they told you they already have another agent. Well, yeah, it says that they're, they're thinking about interviewing other agents. It says they have already chosen another agent. And then she went on and tried to steal the business from the other agent. That's literally what signed? it says. Is there anything? Signed? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would say the assumption there is they haven't signed anything. It's that, hey, we think we're going to go with this person. Great. Can I give you a second opinion? All right. All right. At that point, that's okay. I mean, that's just interviewing multiple. Well, yeah, if they've chosen someone and signed with them, then you're out. You know, go give a second opinion to a side client. Yeah, agree with you there for sure. I just like the fact that she would continue. Like, she wouldn't just let the first conversation be the last one. She would just continue to talk to them over time. Super good. Yeah, and yeah. she just and uh, just kind of carry on that a little bit. She is so confident. I mean, that whole um, passage is just extreme confidence right everything she's saying she she i i can hear her saying it. i've never even heard her talking i can hear her saying it mm -hmm. um extremely confident in everything she's saying my biggest takeaway is um you know she calls them early in the mornings between seven and eight before she goes to work so she wants to be the first agent in the door so day one expired day one fisbo whatever it is she wants to call at eight o'clock in the morning because she wants to be everyone else to the phone call too so that way they don't have that same opportunity she wants to be the first one in the door um, and then ask them what they're going to do next. So you're obviously uncovering, you know, the, their motivation. I mean, that's a huge, huge piece of it. And then the rest of it that follows is, is 
purely scripting with confidence, right? She's clearly done this before and she knows exactly what she's saying. She knows what her value is and she's confident in how she's saying it. Now, being that direct may or may not be people's personality. I'd say I'm direct, not at all compared to her, but <laughs> at the same time, you know, obviously what is your, what is your strength and how can you again be a value to them? And, and that's what she's talking about. She's a great scripter. You can tell by, you know, she has what she's going to say based off. I haven't chosen an agent yet and I'm ready to be interviewed or I have chosen an agent. Well, great. When you want to get a second opinion, you're under, you know, what financial surgery, how like direct is that? Like that is in your faith, financial surgery. You're about to make the biggest, you know, uh, investment of your life a life, wouldn't you want to get a second opinion before you go through with something like this? So extremely confident in everything she was talking about. Yeah. The one thing also about Diana is she would love on you. So she's not just like this all the time. Like she would come from monster contribution to the point where Diana became the single leading listing agent in all of Remax, in all of the nation, and for out of Denver, Colorado. Single mom, two kids. Yeah. She's a total badass, super direct, super confident, but she was like, I had nothing to lose. Like I've already lost it all once, let's go. So whether that's your style or not, either way, there's some gold nuggets in there. Let's look at the next one, the indirect approach from Gene Grubb. Another just awesome. Gene was like the Austin, Texas queen. She was one of Gary Keller's first ever recruits. It's pretty neat. So here we go. Let's take um, about another four minutes here. We'll go through that. That'll bring us to Makes me feel warm inside. So I'll check this one. Good. Make it the way through. All right. Let's talk about this one. At least three. What do you got? What do you like or hate? I like that she modified her eight by eight plan that um, depend like due to the fact that for sublight owners uh, set like give up within two to three weeks. Um, I love it. Yeah. Isn't that where we kicked off? Like customized eight by eight or e three pack. It's all different. Oh. Yeah, I love that. I love that she identified in her market in two to three weeks, they're just exhausted, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what I used to do when I would go on for sell by owners is, let's say they didn't want to choose me as their listing agent, but they were like fresh for sell by owners. I would say, if you can sell it in a week, I'll help you handle the transaction or two weeks, I'll help you handle the transaction. It's usually 14 days, handle the transaction for X amount of dollars, right? Basically, I'll represent you for a base fee because you advertised it, you got the client. I'll at 14 or at 15 days for active loan. And they'd be like, yeah, absolutely. So it was like the easiest way to get for sale by owner listings because it gave them the opportunity to try it. But like this says, they get worn out. 
you can just list it right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else do you guys like in this one? The way that she gave them flyers of another property that was sold around the fish boats. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. So they know what's going on and wonder why the house is not sold yet. I agree. Love that. Yeah. So good. She actually like, listened and paid attention to people too, right? Mm -hmm. On that first walkthrough, she's taking notes and listening to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas Diana was like pushing, pushing, pushing. She's the opposite. She's receiving, receiving, receiving. You know, one's not bad, one's not good. They're just different, right? What else do you guys like? At least one more here. Yeah. Um, if they're not willing to pay the commission, can you just move on without pushing the matter? Just cut bait. There you go. No, no big deal. See ya. There's more business out there, right? So you, you get to decide how far you want to push it. Like Diana was going to push and push and push and continue to contact because that was the way she lead generated, right? That doesn't mean it has to be the way you lead generated. Now, I would be a mix between these two. So I would use a modified eight by eight, but I'm also pretty direct with sellers, right? I'm not as direct as Christian on the phone, but in person, I am for sure. Like, hey, you want to pay your commission? No. Like, Thanks, that's, that's a, these are our scripts, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Any other questions? <laughs> it just, it's over, right? So you, you can marry some of these tactics together. What I want to point out to you guys, though, is Diana did all of that on the call, okay? Over here in Jean's process, she had two weeks of intentional custom connection. So in other words, way more work. Right now, is it good, bad? I don't know. Right, it might work for you, it might not work for you. It's all about you. But if you work it, it will work on the indirect style. Right, the direct approach is just you're making calls. Right, on the indirect approach, you're making contact, and you have eight steps of either custom marketing or intentional communications. It's a lot. So just keep in mind that if you're picking an indirect style over a direct style, that you're going to have to really focus in on working it. Right. So when we talked about lead generating for three hours over here on these eight steps. These are the things that we would be doing in those three hours of lead generation. Right. It's not always calls, it's setting up good information. Any questions on those two? Any other ahas or fun? Got anything to add over there, Mr. Direct? No, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, yeah, one's just going to be a little bit more work and the other one you kind of cut through. But um, I know a lot of people you know, wouldn't mind to do stuff like that. My, my biggest takeaway from, from that second one is it was obviously a little bit out of touch with our market, right? I mean, That's true. how you can just tell how much slower that market moves than our market now. I mean, she's got time to preview the home, um, right? Thank you, knows, wait, do all this time. I mean, I don't have time to do it with, with for sale by owners. I mean, they're still selling so quickly, right? If they're priced correctly, they're still gonna sell quick. So as far as bringing your value, you know, I don't, I think this, this method would be a little bit out of touch and would, would need to be adjusted in our current market. Um, however, that's exactly what worked for her. And I have no doubt that if she were in this market, she would still have success with it. She would find a way to, to, to get her, her value across and still be like come from contribution to that for sale by owner. That's exactly right. Yeah. The market at the moment is going to be really important in your approaches. No doubt about that. And it should completely change your scripts and all of this too. Like again, recipe cards probably not going to get you that for sale by owner, right? <laughs> it's just not. But a direct call and say, hey, if I list today, I can have it sold by Saturday. What do you think? You know, that might work. Okay. And one that I used to use too is if I don't sell your house in 36 hours, um, uh, I'll, you can fire me as your agent. It's like, well, in this market, if it's a good enough house and you price it well, it's sold in 36 hours. Like, yeah, 36 offers in 36 hours, you know? Yeah. Okay. Let's go over to page 24. I love page 24 because page 24 is the difference between people who grow big businesses and great businesses. Um, all right, don't have anything for page 24. This page alone is the difference between great business owners and terrible <clears throat> business owners or people that consistently fall off. Did you know that 80% of every licensee becomes unlicensed within five years of getting licensed? So if your you know, licensee class of you know, 2015 was 100 people, that means only 20 are still in business in 2020. Isn't that crazy? You know what the difference is? Persistence. 
So that's page 24. I don't have a slide for it. I just pointed at the slides, but it's page 24. I want to read you just a little bit of that first paragraph and you might hate me for it if you want, but th this is just the number one thing I see all the time with agents. And right now we're working with them literally around the nation. So in some new, in some markets, new FISBOs and expired withdrawn listings are inundated with phone calls and visits from real estate agents. We get that, right? New FISBO hits on Zillow, particularly, it's going to get a lot of calls. Be creative about where you find them, by the way. Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace. You know, there's other sources out there other than Zillow. It is important to remember that homeowners may not be interested in doing business with you the first time you contact them. Duh. Like, well, they just listed FISBO. Why do you think? Like, we already discovered why they probably listed FISBO. They're not interested in you. They just stuck a sign in their yard, right? Many agents make the mistake of not following up. This next line is a gut check. Our research shows, by the way, I mentioned it when I taught, KWU is literally staffed professors, literal PhDs that write this stuff. I was in their offices start of April, like incredible human beings, like so smart. Our research shows that 50% of agents will not follow up after the first week. How do we think we're going to get it? How do we get any business? It's not the first call that just magically converts. It's the second, the third, the fourth, the how many calls, Christian? Well, it takes like seven, honestly. And I mean, obviously, so we do have like a little bit of stats. I think it's changed a little bit. Again, the the market a little bit. I remember when I first started, Ashley would say, you know, one out of four for sale owners, you should be able to book first call. The two out of four will be in follow up. That fourth one you'll never get because they're too high. They're too stubborn. They're this, they're that. They've got an it, whatever it is. But I would say now it's probably one in four off the first call. That might even be a little high. And then one out of four in follow-up. And that one in four in follow-up is so important, um, especially when you consider um, the amount of fall-through we've seen. I mean, obviously, as agents, we're seeing more fall-through with appraisal gaps and inspections, all these things that are coming up, and we deal with it every day. So why would they be any different, right? So having more intentionality behind what your follow-up looks like and you know, checking in, hey, I mean, if I call Springfield 3-2, it's in Kickapoo, under 200,000, well, yeah, it's going to be our contract by the weekend. Um, and, um, you know, maybe I'll call after, you know, day 10, like, hey, Mr. Seller, I just want to check, make sure you're, you guys were through inspections. Have you guys gotten that far yet? Um, yeah, I got a, you know, no inspection. All right, great. No big deal. I'm going to call again here in like two weeks. Hey, have you guys had your appraisal? You know, are you guys still under contract, right? I'm going to continue following up even though it's under contract right? It's a super, super simple and quick follow-up, right? It's not nothing that takes a bunch of time, super quick call and not, not a lot to it. Hey, you've got a really great home. I just want to see, you know, in case it comes back up, you know, what I could do so I don't miss out on it again. So really quick, really easy phone call. Um, and there's a ton of business to be had in that because obviously we're going to see, you know, I'm, I don't know what the numbers are on FISBO fall through percentage, but I mean, national average is like 15% right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's just at least that. So stay, stay in front of it and be a good value. Double or triple because they don't have agents fighting to hold it together. Yeah. Right? All right. I want to give you guys the West Litton framework that's actually ripped off by, from Jim Rohn. Okay. This guy call us the thirds. And this is how you're going to determine where to spend your energy inside of the leads that you might talk to. Okay. So if this rectangle represented everyone in the world, which it doesn't, it's a rectangle. But if it did, we would split everyone in the world into thirds. And I would say maybe everyone in your world. How's that? Everyone in your world, everyone you meet, everyone you could meet, everyone you talk to. Okay. The first third is comprised of people who like you. Put you in there. They like you. They're, they're like, they genuinely think you're a great person. They want to interact with you. They're excited about you. They're off. They're awesome people. You like them. They like you. We're happy. You might be friends. You might be acquaintances. Doesn't really matter. Second one, second third is people who hate you, right? Hate's a strong word, but it's really just people who don't like you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't care, right? They're just like, uh, I've met Wes. He's not for me. It's okay. There's going to be a third of everyone in the world or everyone in my world that doesn't like me, hates me, right? The last segment is going to be a third who doesn't care. They don't care about you. It's not that they don't like you or don't not like you. It's just they're apathetic about it, right? 
So it's a third. So if I call three people, there's a chance that I get one of each, right? But if I called everyone in, I, in my world, odds are it's going to land somewhere around the thirds, the rule of the thirds. So back when I used to recruit in the team leader position, I had to keep this in mind. But as I interacted with people, a third of them would be like, that guy is not for me. And I have to be okay with that. Then there would be a third that Steve really did not give a rip. They were like, ignore your call, might say hi to you once, whatever. But then there was a third that liked me. That third is where I could get business from, right? So when we're in this lead gen, and you just brought it up, it's like you might call four and you know, two might go into follow up and one might convert. Well, you might call three and have a like you, hate you, and don't care about you. Who are you going to follow up with? Like you and don't care about you. Yeah, yeah. So the like you is going to get 99% of your attention, right? They're the people that you have some version of a connection with that you might be able to continue that connection with. Hate you is get nothing, right? Zero percent. And the don't care about you is going to get one percent because they're probably not going to connect with you anyway, right? Because every one of us also fit into the like you, hate you, and don't care about you categories for other people, right? There's a lot of people that I like. There's a few that I will not take their phone call. And there's a few that I just don't care. It's not that I don't like them. It's not that I hate them. It's just don't care, right? We all have that. So keep your focus inside of that like you. So when we're talking about persistence inside of FISBOs, it's going to be the people that we've connected with is who we're going to, uh, the people that we've connected with is going to get the majority of our follow-up attention. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Does it also help you kind of frame just in general, people in your business. So like sometimes we have terrible experiences with customers and let's say we jumped the moon for them and they still hate us because the refrigerator that came with the house went out three weeks after closing and it was my fault. And they told all their friends and left me the one star review on Google. You should have got them a home warranty. I know. <laughs> I know. But even if I would have, it wouldn't have mattered because they would have had a $25 deductible on a home warranty. Right? That's the hate use. They don't care about you. are the ones that you sell and you try to follow up with and they just never connect. They're like, I just don't need you. I just needed your service. And you're like, dang it. And then you have the fans, your advocates, right? All your business. I would say 99% of your follow-up goes into it, but 99% of your business is going to come out of your advocates. The people that like you or that connect with you. So find the advocates, right? That's what we're talking about here. We're finding hot leads, trying to convert them. But really what we're doing is identifying advocates. Is that cool? All right, so persistency around advocates. Uh, there's the story about Brad Puffer, uh, North Carolina. That's a pretty fun one. Keep in mind, this was written in 2003, so some of this stuff's not totally awesome. Okay, mindset. Here we go. Number one, come from contribution. We've covered this. Set realistic expectations. Don't let rejection get you down. Who likes being told no? Mm -hmm. Christian, how often do you get told no in a day, would you say? No, no, no. So the time. Yeah, super fun, right? The one percent, super rewarding. Yeah, both, both inside in your head and financially. Yeah, absolutely, right? And again, that one percent is this: it's the like use, right? You might have some follow ups in the don't cares, but you're going to have some follow ups in the like use. But you're going to get no all the flipping time. There's a great little book called Go for No. It's a little pamphlet book. They might even have them upstairs. They used to sell them at the front desk. Just go for no. It's a way to reframe your day to where if you're going through and you're making a lot of calls for your lead generation, you're going to start tallying how many no's it takes you to get a yes. Okay? Because if you know your no, if you know your no to yes ratio, then you understand what's going to take to get your next deal or next appointment. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're all getting no's. Like Christian's calling, Justin's calling, my calling, Brandy's calling. It's all the same. Like we're all being told no at some point. Go for no? Yeah, it's just like, a, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it's literally like the tiniest little pamphlet book. You don't use. Yeah. Well, just bought it. It's like three bucks a year. Yeah, it's tiny too. They might even have them upstairs still. But it, the go for no, you're just going to count how many hate you and don't care about you. You get to you get like you. All right. The last piece here has come from contribution. The two point or three points on this slide are so important. Ask them. What can I do to help you today? 
we talked about this morning, one of the best ways to lead generate in general is just to say, hi, how are you? Like what's new in your life, right? Offer your expertise. I don't have expertise. I'm a new agent, bull sharks. You have expertise because you can actually transact on legal forms. You have the necessary connections to lenders, title companies. And if you don't have those connections, you have people who have the connections really close to you. People don't want experts. They want professionals, right? So I hate that it says offer your expertise. It should say offer your professionalism, right? That you're going to take their business seriously. That you're going to work to find their answers. If you don't have the answer, you're going to say, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing right now. Let me get the right answer for you. That way there's no mistakes. Or at the moment, I don't know, but let me find that out for you, right? People love that. All right. And then, of course, offer services. If you don't ever ask for business, we don't ever get it. All right, friends, we are going to break here for a little bit. And then we're going to jump back in. And then we're going to hit basically scripts, right? Yeah. We're going to go over scripts together. It'll be fun. And we're not going to make you call like the packet says we should. <laughs> Thank you. It said to bring a list and have the participants call. I'm like, oof. I don't know about that one. Let's take about 10 minutes here. Return calls, use the restroom, to grab water. Do you even need a bottle of water? Nope. Does anyone have a good chiropractor? I do. Yeah? He's a uh, Dr. Kelly. On Seminole and Glenstone. Okay. It's uh, near the cemetery. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a very good one. Oh, man. I slept weird last night. Mm. I'm just hurting. I went to, I had to go to this guy and nix it a few times. I forgot where, I forgot his name, but he's over by Coyotes. Mm. He, he does a good job. Like, I literally moved. I'm a nurse. I'm still a nurse, but I yeah. moved like a corner. Really big person and hurt my back. And so I had to go get treated quite a bit. I slept with an arm on my nightstand and the other arm behind my head. It's so like my shoulders and like neck are killing me. It's not moving a 400 pound person. That's impressive. Yeah. That's no. Impressive. Hard. I used to be a circus performer. So I had, you know, a lot of the injuries. Oh, hold on, hold on. You used to be a circus performer? What the heck? Yeah. What did you do? Uh, everything like I used to ride elephants, juggling hula hoops. Uh, she got video. For what? Uh, that is so I cool. Have a lot of videos. <laughs> you should see some of the videos, man. Hey, I believe her. She doesn't have to tell me twice. That is so cool. Yeah, but that's the downside to yeah, you know, a lot of the injuries. You yeah, eat up your body all the time. Yeah. So every time I was in Springfield, chiropractor, he yeah. does a really good job. I need to find out if my insurance covers it. That's going to be the big one. They don't usually. No. If they do, it's only a portion and it's a small amount. And then you have to just pay for it out of pocket. Because we have a high deductible. Yeah. Then might as well just go get a massage, right? I mean, that's another <laughs> option. Just get a massage. <laughs> what they really need to do is they need to figure out like a, a both and. Like you can get either chiropractor or massage or you can get both, where they adjust you and then give you a massage. That one, he gets massage too. That would be so cool. He does. Yeah. He has all kinds of tools for massage. See, that's what we're talking about. All right, we're getting free massages. Is that what you said? Oh, we're talking about chiropractic. I mean, she was in the circus. What the heck? She was a circus. That, that goes together, so right? Freaky cool. Chiropractic. So, circus. What, what did you, you, what did you do in the circus? I used to do. She was the one I used to ride elephants. I used to be a juggler, a little for aerialist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then we're going to ask you guys to partner up or group up to then role play them together. Does that sound good? Do we have the scripts? They should be in your book, page 37. Okay. And if you, someone wants a paper version, there's a, an extra here. A little paper. Okay. All right, Christian, you ready to go? Yeah. You want to read off this? Or you just want to make one up? Yeah, there is. Nope. Let's go ahead and do this. Okay. Uh, you want me to be the agent? Yeah, you're the agent. You have to say ring, ring. <laughs> ring, ring. Hello? Hi, um, my name is Christian. I'm a real estate agent with the Barris Network, and I was wondering if your house was still for sale. Yes, it is. Awesome. Well, I work with a ton of buyers and a lot of sellers in this area, so I was just wondering how I could help you. Well, I can't really think of anything. Well, Mr. Seller, uh, if I could bring you an offer that would net you the amount of money you feel you must net in order to sell your home, uh, you'd consider that offer, wouldn't you? Uh, does it include a commission? If I bring the offer, it would. And my question is, if the offer nets you the amount of money you feel you must net, would you consider the offer? Yeah, I guess so. So to be sure your home will fit my buyer's needs, when would be the best time to look at your home? Today at three or tomorrow at five? Uh, do you have anyone in mind for it? Um, I'm not too sure. You know, I, I can't tell until I see your home. Uh, you see, I preview houses for my buyers. And I, and I only take them houses I know will meet their needs at once. So until I see the house, I'm not sure if it will be appropriate for anyone I'm working with at the moment. Um, I like to be familiar with everything that is on the market so I can provide the best possible service to my customers. So would you like me to put your house on that list of properties that I show my buyers? Uh, I guess that sounds okay. Awesome. What would be a good time? Uh, today at three or tomorrow at five? Four or five. Okay, awesome. Um, so then that's like, that's that first script, right? Yep. So pretty straightforward, right? I was pretty amicable. What he didn't ask was, can I list your house? What was that? Yeah. A lot of kind of what that, it can be a little bit us in the real estate world. You know, we, we kind of use this, you know, terminology that resonates with us a little bit more. Whenever we say that kind of verbiage to them, it might just, I don't want to say go in one ear and out the other, but it doesn't like sit with them like it would for us. So nothing in there said, you know, we're going to list your house or we're bringing a buyer. It was really, really general. And if we could bring you an offer that nets you what you need to out of it, would you work with us? Right. And they're like, oh, oh yeah. Okay, great. Well, I want to get there and see, run some numbers by you and check out the home in person so I can talk to you what that looks like. So I can get there and show, hey, comps are at 250. I can list at 250. You walk away with, you know, 235 or whatever. And you know, it's 235 enough for you to pay off your mortgage and go do motivation, right? So until I get in person, now I can talk about it and I feel like, oh, well, I, I'm obviously for some owner, I, I want to continue listening by myself. Okay, and, and besides, I mean, I feel really confident that I can get you 235. Like, what are some other objections? But now you're in person, we're talking about what they need out of it, and you can kind of just take it from there. Yeah. All right, guys, let's pair up and go over that script one more time together. Someone, uh, partner A, whoever partner A is, can be the agent and B can be FISBO. You guys can go through the partners if you want. You know what? Okay. I'm Nathan Blanton. I'm a real estate agent. Keller Williams. I was wondering if your house is still for sale. Yes, it is. Great. I work with a lot of buyers and sellers in this area. I was wondering how I could think of scripts that are not mine. Uh, well, you uh, It sounds like we are even like for the It's for the most part the same, but it's not. If I bring in what the offer I would, and my question is, if the offer nets you the amount of money you feel you must net, would you consider the offer? That's a buy yes or no. Be sure your home will fit my buyers to the thousand dollars in it. Would be the best time to look at this property. Then we at two five hundred dollar buyer. Not more than three percent. When it gets a thousand, it's tomorrow's going to be back. Oh man. Yeah. Who's it between? Kevin. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, the financial. What are you doing? I got to see more up for there. So the start Monday is like. Way I'm not sure. I can't and tell until I see your September home. September yeah, preview home for my buyers. Oh, it goes that long. Uh, take <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's not just lose weight. Way. It's like keep it until I see the house. I don't know if that will be appropriate. So but you don't have to like do this eating drink in the summer. Yeah, I mean, you can. Uh, this is the market. Yeah, I know you want to look good in the summer, but. 
That's a long time. It's a super long time. I haven't been here today. It's just a very good vodka water. You like permission to clean your house and the rest of the properties that I show my buyers. I guess that sounds like it. Terrific. So it's a good time for me to come over again because tomorrow at 4 30. Yeah, tomorrow at 4 30. Perfect. Okay, see you then. Get to the appointment. All right. All right. Ring, ring, ring. Do an objection over here. Hello. Hi, my name is Justin. I have an additional uh, question. So I wondered if your house is still for sale. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, I work with a lot of buyers and sellers in the area. I was wondering to know how I can help you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amber. I'm not sure what you mean. I can't think of anything. I was wondering if you could bring me an offer that would make me the amount of money you feel like you're lost. I work with a lot of buyers and sellers in this area, so I was wondering how I could help you. Yeah, I mean, my bottom line is I want. 450 out of my home, so yeah, if I get 450, well, Michelle, if I could bring you an offer that would net you the amount of money you would fill, the offer include a commission? I ain't paying you a commission, Justin. Hey, so it's myself. If I bring the offer, my question is if the offer nets you the amount of money you fill, you must that would you consider the offer? To be sure your home will fit my buyer's needs, when would be the best time for me to come look at your home? Today at two or four? Do you have us. someone in mind? Um, I'm not no, for no, sure. I can't no, tell until I see your home. You see, I preview so all of my homes for my buyers, sure your home is and I don't take them to the houses I know yeah, that will make yeah, them meet their needs. So until I see a yeah, house, I don't know if it will be sure appropriate for anyone I'm working with right now. I like to the first time. I think that's the best possible So would you like to get your house and list of properties that I can show my buyers? Yeah, that's great. Well, do we have someone in mind? For four o'clock. You know, I'm not sure yet. Yes, yes. I need houses for my buyers. Let's just role play. How many objections do you have? Houses that I know. So you stop me on it. So I can't like, ah, uh, what do we say? What did Denver teach me? What did Denver teach me? Yeah. 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 Yeah
I work with a lot of buyers and sellers in the area, and I'm wondering if I might be able to help you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't uh, why would you want to do that? Right. Uh, I'm actually selling with yeah. some house. Yeah. 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 Hey, I respect that you're selling that house yourself. And I think there's some win win opportunities as well. So, first, I think I might be able to find a buyer for you because I work with so many buyers in the area. Second, all right, guys, are you guys ready for the next one? I mean, we might as well. We're reading, we're reading, but we don't have time. You guys are going all the way through them all. Yeah. Oh, I thought we were supposed to. Oh, just one of you role play, and then we'll come back together and we'll keep doing more. All right. Christian's now going to give us his phys his physbo script that he uses. Is that cool? Yeah. Pass it over. Pass it out. Yeah. He doesn't have it. This Read is all the transcript. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of changes. It's like I've got a really rough draft, like Google Doc, and it's super messy. I've sent it out to some other people. I'm like, I haven't touched it in a while. I don't know what's in there. There's just like some thoughts and. Whatever, and then give him some objections too. It's yeah. gonna be great. He'll stop me for sure. <laughs> um, hello, um, I was trying to reach the owner or the owner of a property that's for sale on One Two Three Main Street. Was that yours? Yeah, yeah, that's mine. Awesome. Well, my name's Christian. I work for the Barris Network. Um, I've got a couple questions. If you got a minute, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I've got your uh, Zillow listing pulled up real quick. I'm, I'm looking through some of the photos. I'm reading the description. I mean, you've got a really cool property. Um, do you mind me asking what has you looking at selling it? Oh, we're just we're just looking to get something a little bit smaller. Okay. And do you guys already have this on picked out or are you wait for this one to sell? Um, not yet. No, we probably maybe rent for a year and then buy something. Okay, gotcha. Um, well, yeah, I mean it's a great market to do it. I definitely understand wanting to take advantage of the market. Um, so I was I was calling, you know, I wanted to get some information on the front end so I could get it back to my team and, and some people I'm working with. Um, so that way I'm not calling you uh, calling you back a, a bunch of times, asking you a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. Um is it pretty easy for you to handle showings? Yeah, so far it hasn't been too bad. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I've been a lot of them though. Awesome. Not a lot of showings so far. No, a lot of calls. Okay. Yeah, and you've only you've only been on a day or so, right? So you, yeah. Do you have any offers in yet? No offers yet. We have people saying that they're going to offer, but no offers. Okay. And do you have any showings set up, or you said just phone calls so far? Yeah, we we've only had one showing, but a lot of phone calls, a lot of agents calling too. Okay. Um. Well, yeah. Um. Let me see. So you so you've got some showings. Uh, you've already had one. Did you get any feedback as to to what they said on it? If they're going to put an offer in or not? Yeah, most agents that call just want to list it. So I, I you know, I, I don't really know. It sounds like you might have buyers though that would be interested. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a, a ton of buyers I'm working for. We also have buyers agents and sellers agents on our team. So there's probably more ways than one that we can help you out. Um, like I said, there's just not a lot of inventory out there right now, and I, I just kind of want to get this back to our team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you've got it priced really well. I see you've got it on Zillow at, um, you know, 350. Is that um, just, did someone help you with comps or is that just kind of what you're looking to get out of it? Well, my neighbor down the road sold for, you know, 325. And so mine's a little nicer than his. So I just figured I'd try 350. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard to beat. you know, all the, I can see you guys have done a ton of upgrades. So I, I totally get it. Um, and then at your price of 350, are you, were you guys planning on working with agents at that price or would we need to add our commission on top if we were to bring you an offer? Um, we we can pay an agent 3%, like a buyer's agent. 3%. Okay. Uh, awesome. or we weren't planning on listing it, you know, paying a listing agent. Okay. So quick math. So you guys are roughly looking to walk away with like three 38 or something. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, right. so as long as you guys walk away with 338, you guys are good to walk with it or work with agents, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, like I said, I definitely don't want to cut into what you guys are looking to net out of it. However, I don't want commission to be the reason we don't get a help. Um, you know, I, I see you've got, um, obviously you're, you're planning on working with agents at that price. Um, do you mind me asking why didn't, um, why didn't list it and you decided to try it on your own? Yeah. You know, I just figured we'd save roughly 3% and yeah, that'd just be the easiest way to, so, I mean, the market's so good. I just mm -hmm. figured if we could save 3%, we might as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I totally understand, you know, wanting to save on a commission, you know, it is a really great market. Um, typically how, we, how we've been able to help for sale by owners in the past is we can typically cover our commission, you know, by getting you an offer better than what you can get on your own. So what that means is that you can actually end up netting what you need to out of it. And, you know, we can get you more exposure and more marketing that way you can get the best offer out there and not just an offer. So, you know, if at the end of the day, you know, we can met, uh, net you what you need to out of it, that 338 number, um, is there any other reason you, you might not be opposed to, uh, to listing it with us? Um, I mean, it just kind of seems like a little bit of a headache. We're already on the market, you know, while we're on Zillow and 
and uh, it just kind of seems like a little bit of a headache, honestly. Sure. Do you, do you mind me asking, is, is the headache would be being a for sale by owner or what's the headache? <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, it hasn't been easy. That's a good point. Yeah. But uh, no, the last agent we worked with, it just was a really, really not good experience. And, um, so we, we you know, just thought maybe we could sell it ourselves instead of having to use someone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Can you tell me more about kind of what happened with your with your last uh, realtor experience? Oh, uh, well. It was a showing and, you know, she had to go to the bathroom and she pooped in our toilet and left it there. <laughs> Gosh. It is just really annoying. It's super That's like traumatic. Can I have That's traumatic. Yeah, I wouldn't want to work with that real star again either. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're and a... XP now, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, great. You know, we are, um, you know, like I said, I work for the Bears Network. We're a really big team here in Springfield. We're, we're going to uh, probably close anywhere from 750 to 850 homes this year. Um, you know, we bring about 30 to 40 listings to market every single month. And, you know, what that means to you is, you know, obviously we do a lot of business. Uh, we, we've helped a lot of sellers like you. And I know that it's important for you to net as much as possible on the sale of this home. Is that correct? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, we're definitely in the business of making sure our, our clients net the most amount of money. So if we can still do that for you, and obviously we don't have that bad experience of, you know, someone taking a dump in your toilet. <laughs> is there any other reason, you know, you'd be opposed to working with someone like us? No, I guess not. Surely there's something else of why you not want to work with someone like us. <laughs> uh... Well, you know, if I was going to work with an agent, I'd want to work with that agent, not necessarily a yeah, big team. Okay. Have you worked with the team in the past? No, just uh, just that guy who was that agent. Just the, just the duty. Yeah. Oh, so he's a solo agent. Just the duty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So he's a solo agent. Yes. Okay. So you'd only want to work with a solo agent again. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, it just seems easier. Can you tell me why that is? Well, because when I call them, I'll talk to them. And, you know, I'm sure you're probably going to send someone great out here. But, you know, I like you. I don't know them. Yeah, absolutely. We've got the greatest agents out there for sure. And so what happens if, you know, you were to work with a solo agent and, you know, they're busy, and, you know, showing houses or doing some other things? Because, of course, they're going to have other listings that they've got to take care of. Or if they're on vacation, do you know, I mean, are, are they just going to get back to you next week when they get back to vacation? Or do you know how to handle that? That's a dig because I'm about to go on vacation here first. Yeah, yeah, you're you're probably right. Go ahead and send them out. <laughs> All right. So here, let's reverse the script, okay? So you said I work with Veris Network, right? You don't have to work with Veris Network to have those stats. I'm with Keller Williams. We bring hundreds of homes to market every month. We have the most proven systems and models out of any company in the entire world. Let me leverage those systems and models for you to get your house sold. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're all part of a team, whether we like it or not. And that team is Keller Williams. Use Keller Williams stats. That's why they go over them at the market center level is it's stuff that you can literally just plug right into this. So we say team because we have a team. But when I didn't have a team, I said Keller Williams. It was my team. So I would still say I'm a, I'm on a team at Keller Williams. Uh, collectively, we're going to bring whatever the stat was at the time, 500 houses to market this month with the best systems and models available, right? So we're gonna break it down that way or the same script of, you know, why you wouldn't wanna work with a solo agent could be reversed and it could be the exact same script, right? So you, I, I had said, you know, oh yeah, I was working with him, like solo agent. Yeah, you wouldn't wanna work with a solo agent, no. And then you had said, um, it said, what if he goes on vacation or what if he's out showing other houses or what if he has other listings, flip that around. Well, you know, well, we want to work with, you know, Veris Network. Well, why would you work with Veris Network? Their agents are extremely busy. They are extremely hard to get to get, to get a hold of. That team is going to bring a lot of houses to market. So they're servicing a lot of other customers at any given point. They're not going to have the flexibility in their schedules and their freedom like I do as an individual agent. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the same script. It's just flipped. Right. So he's, he's used to the team side. So it's coming from the team side, but on the solo side, you can just absolutely decimate teams with the same script, just in reverse. Right? Honestly, you can do that with any single objection, right? There's, there's multiple ways of looking at it, uh, every single thing. So, and there's good and bad things. Obviously there's good and bad things of being on a team. There's good and bad things about being a seller agent. So, I mean, it's just you and the, and the seller who are on the phone call. So obviously sell yourself. I mean, we're, 
that's about as salesy as I feel real estate gets, but that's your time to, to prove your worth and show what value you are to them. I'm a solo agent, right? I mean, I've, I'm hungrier than anyone else. I'm going to work harder than anyone else. I only got two listings right now. I'm going to work much harder than Wes, who's over here doing nothing all day, just waiting for people to call him and list their house, right? I'm going to work much harder for you than he's going to work for you. So why would you go with a guy who's just going to wait for business to come to him? Another, that same line is, you know, well, I want to work with someone who's got more experience. Like, because that's a big mind block that we have as new agents is, well, I want to work with someone like Ethel Kerbo, who's on billboards and has been doing this since, you know, the Stone Age. I love her, but, you know, <laughs> I until I saw her sign yesterday. She still crushes it. It's incredible. You know, she still lead generates cold every single day, like cold legion. She's just a machine. Anyway, I want to work with someone like Ethel Kerbo. And the question could be, why? Ethel Kerbo is the one running billboards and these massive advertisements, just hoping that business comes to her. The reason we're talking today is because I'm proactive about finding homes for my buyers. So if you list with me, I'm going to be just as proactive to find buyers for your home. Right. So same script, just flipped. I used to use that one on Adam Craddy all the time. He would call me and be like, you know we lead generate, right? Because his ISAs would get the script back from this for sale by owner or expired. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, let's go ahead and move into expireds. We're going to wrap up on this. I know we're just over, but this is a really good um, expired script here. Um, the make contact script, right? So make contact, set an appointment. And yep. I'm on uh, 51. So we're going to jump over to the expires here. All right. Do you want me to be agent this time? Sure. Ring, ring. Howdy. Hi, I'm looking for Christian. Is she available? Excuse you? <laughs> Is he available? <laughs> yeah, he's right here. Well, fantastic. Hi, Christian. My name is Wes and I'm a real estate agent with Keller Williams here in Springfield, Missouri. I hope I'm catching you at a good time. I just wanted to check and see if you knew that your home is no longer on the market. Hi, Tess. Um, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, my computer shows that it's not on the market any longer. And since I sell a lot of homes in your area, I'm calling to see when you're planning on interviewing a new agent for the job of getting your home sold. You can answer if you'd like to. I was just I'm sorry. I was reading over what he said. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually. I think, yeah, I think we're good to go here. That's a good line, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, my my agent is really good, so I, I didn't know it was off the market, but um, I mean, I'm just gonna stick it back up with them again. Gotcha. Well, it's interesting that you weren't informed that your listing had expired. You know. I don't mean to be rude to your agent and I don't know who it is, but I would feel like I didn't do my client a service if I had let his listing expire. Is that fair? Yeah, that seems fair. So in this case, I would love to meet with you, give you a second opinion and see if maybe working with us might be able to solve some of the frustrations you're having with your home not selling. Okay. Whatever, I mean, closing line yeah, I mean, use there. yeah, I mean, typically, um, I mean, I would say to take it like a little bit further, like if they're going to object because they're going to um you know, it's not that like it's a gratification of i'm getting them on the phone like immediately um that's gonna be like oh well you know i've got this obligation you know i went to high school with this girl and she is lead generating messaged me on facebook one day and i was happen to be looking at selling my house so I, I feel like i've got an over an obligation to you know uh continue selling my house that's good how do you counteract that so i mean yeah um Again, it's like kind of casting doubt in a way that doesn't like disrespect the other agent. It's like, hey, I totally understand. It helps to know someone in real estate. Um, you know, if she didn't, um, you know, reach out to you, is there an agent in mind of who you'd go with? Uh, you know, no, not really. I'm, I'm pretty new to this area, so I don't, I don't know any. I don't have anyone in mind. Okay, awesome. And you know, I saw that you were on the market for you know 90 days. How's the activity while you guys were on? Uh, not too bad. Um, you know, had some showings, had some feedback, but, you know, obviously didn't get the offer we were looking for. I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I know it's a great market and um, obviously want to make sure you guys can net what you guys need to out of it. Um, and honestly, I didn't ask, what had you guys looking at selling? Motivation is this. So you just go back in. Yeah, the same I do the exact same thing. It's all motivation, timeline, price, all those things I'm trying to get out. So that way I can better like formulate what I'm going to talk to them about and how I can best bring value to them. 
So then that would that way I know like what objections to handle. Um, is it worth my to follow up with? A lot of times you're gonna deal with people who are like, you know, my mom's an agent. I was like, all right, well, I mean, if you are to list, it's like I'm probably not getting that listing. I don't want to waste my time doing that. I mean, you got to decide which ones are worth following up with and which ones aren't. If someone's just like, oh, I just happen to know some girl from high school that, I mean, she reached out to me and said it, asked for one to sell my house and I just happened to at the time. Great. Well, I, I know it really helps knowing someone in real estate. And, you know, I know it's important that you make as much money as possible on this. Potentially, we just need a second opinion, you know, another fresh marketing approach to get in front of more people. You know, when would be a good time for us to chat? And then just seeing what their objection might be. Because then they might be open to it. And then they say, oh, no, I'm really set with them or whatever. But, you know, asking for business and kind of um, seeing where it takes you. So the concept here is the lead source is different. Same with the PPC lead, all this. So your opening conversations are different. We're still just trying to wrap it back to the same piece of why are you selling? You know, what does that do for you? When do you need to do that by? You know, the basic motivating scripts. It's the same with any of your Mets, right? When you're interacting with people you know and love, and when they raise their hand or they ping ping as a, hey, this could be an opportunity, it's the same conversation. Great, Justin, I'm so glad that we, that we get to work together on this. Why are you selling your house? What's great about that? Where are you going next, right? It's the same motivations. Oh, the computer's restarting. Nice. Oh, and it's updating. So that ended. Anyway, uh, um, class, class is over. Missed, yeah. But it's that same idea. It's just a different opening script. It drops onto a different custom eight by eight plan then. And then inside your conversation, if you're able to get them on the phone, you're going to immediately move into motivations, right? The motivations are the things that allow you to keep the rapport building up. Remember, we talked about know, like, trust, and remember. So the eight by eight plan keeps them in the, in the memory, but the know, like, and trust is actually developed inside of those scripts on the phone, right? So you're going to try to get them to know, like, and trust you by asking them really important questions. You're not gonna get them to know, like, and trust you by asking them what kind of tile is in the kitchen, right? But we wanna to default to the not so painful questions because it's easy for us. But if we move into motivation, which is more a little bit more direct in the question, at the same time though, that's them gonna start making trust deposits in us. Anytime I ask a question and it gets answered, it's a question with substance, right? And that gets answered, it's that seller or that buyer making a trust deposit in me. I need to accumulate as many of those as I can. That way I can formulate how I can add value and make a big deposit of value to them. Does that make sense? Sweet, okay, so that's really it. Wrapping up, please go in, make these your, your own. Of course, you've got your lead generation action plans, your planning worksheets. Three hours of calls. Please don't do that. Sorry, I did that. On the back here, you have some cool stuff. You have an appendix in this one. The appendix is actually really helpful. It has an expired packet that you could form and send to expireds. It's got FISBO letters. So if you wanted to mail them something, another packet, a getting to know me, like as a realtor, a litigation checklist for FISBOs, preparing your home for sale. We used to use that all the time. You know, how to get your house ready for the market. So you contact the FISBO and then you'd send them the how to get your house ready. Create a service provider list, security tips, and then of course an open house sign-in sheet, which is huge if you're going to host those open houses for FISBOs. All right, guys, any questions? I know we kind of didn't hit on, you know, um, everything. Obviously, we had a lot of material to kind of go through. So if you guys like have any like certain specific things, like more one-on-one -on -one time, like these are our emails. Um, we're, I mean, every day, like eight to four, like if you guys want to do any like scripting, I love scripting. It really helps like with the job, like help understand things a little bit farther and just help have someone else to kind of communicate with and, and learn things a little bit deeper. So, um, just let us know uh, if you guys want to schedule a time to kind of meet and go over some stuff, anything that we kind of didn't touch on today, but yeah, I mean, do you guys have any questions right now we can answer? Also, this was Christian's first ever class he's taught. Oh, he did, he did great. Yeah, he did great. Yeah, it's pretty good, huh? Pretty good. Yeah. All right, guys, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay here every day from 8 to 4. Are you, uh, he's not making that office. Office. phone call. What's that? You had not in that office up there? Yeah, I'm in that row of chickens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Sorry to the people on Zoom that 